reading through just about the whole of chapter 6, but from selected verses, it's going to be very difficult for you to follow along. If you'll just let me read. Beginning in verse 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. The Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I've come down from heaven? I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If, if anyone eats of this bread, he will live unlike ever before. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh which I shall give for the life of this world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a saying that is just too hard. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said, Does this offend you? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit they are life. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. One thing that is very characteristic of much of Jesus' teaching, if you read the Gospels on your own, you'll find that his words were very divisive. They would, like, like a sword, just cut through a crowd of people. And at times, you could see, after his message was over, who, the, who just the crowd was. The people who had, who had heard about his fame, popularity, things that he was up to. But then who the committed core were. And even times, those who followed closely, say the disciples, as the text said, would hear something he said and just couldn't digest it. It was too difficult to hear. Quite often his sayings were so shocking that they were hard to digest, such as, I am the bread of life. Those who feed on me will live like never before. It's important to know this because of the season that we have entered. Paul said rightly that Easter is not a day, it's a season. It's seven Sundays to reflect on the realities of the resurrection. The resurrection is something you will have to wrestle with because of the implications if the resurrection is true, then that which Jesus spoke about himself is true. In other words, he is who he says he is, such as, I am the bread. And if he is who he says he is, then the power 
that he claimed to have is true. And if he indeed has the power that he claims to have, then the promises that he made can be trusted. Now these are all three very loaded statements because who he claimed to be and the power he claimed to have and the promises that he made were, like this text, quite shocking. And where you land on the reality of the resurrection will determine whether or not you are part of the core, that, that who can continue to follow even when hearing shocking statements about who he is or what power he has or what promises he's making to you. Or if you're just part of the crowd, that which when you hear something a little too strange, you fade away. The resurrection is a big deal. It's one thing to believe simply in the life that is, say, of digestible historicity. He lived roughly 2,000 years ago. You can accept that. He was reared in a small town, not hard to receive. Raised by a teenage mother, peasant father, had brothers, sisters, and for 30 years he lived in absolute obscurity. Historically, he lived pretty normally, swinging a hammer with his dad, following in his father's footsteps. Never traveled more than 100, maybe 200 miles. Then started this ministry out of nowhere of teaching, and some say, healing. But even in his ministry, didn't live lavishly. If you were to categorize his living, it would look like a homeless person. But then something happened. In the midst of his ministry, the world just turned upside down based on his message, based on something, if you're not just assuming the resurrection. And then all of a sudden, more songs started to be written about this person than anyone in history. Now that fact stands to this day. More paintings painted about this Jewish nobody then painted about anyone, a reality that stands to this day. More books written about this Jewish peasant than any books written about anyone else in history, a reality which stands to this day. And last week, billions, say again, billions on the earth gathered to worship him. Not as just some Jewish nobody, but as a king of some sort, many say king of the universe. Somehow, some reality led to the fact that the, most, the two major holidays on the planet revolve around this person. His birth and the other reality being the resurrection. The question is, what do you say? One thing to hear what other people are saying and to carve up his life in historical terms versus divine terms. It's one thing for me to believe something. What do you say to these claims? They were shocking before we get into the text. John 6, he says, I've come down from heaven. From heaven. That is, from eternity past. That's where I'm from. Don't mark me on the globe. That's not where I'm from. No, I'm not just Joseph's son, as you so put it. This is what the, the Jews were doing that day. Oh, that, that's Jesus. That's, that's little Jesus. He grew up playing baseball in my backyard. The Son of God. He's saying no from eternity past and from eternity onward. I am from heaven. If the resurrection is true, then a statement like that means something quite different than if the resurrection is not true. If it's not true, he's just baby Jesus, who went a little crazy. Maybe in his 30s followed the Grateful Dead around for a little while and then came back, you know. John 10, he says, if you don't believe my words, then watch my actions. And he starts performing miracles. Miracles. This guy has power. This guy, this guy plays with the laws of nature. That's his sandbox. And he manipulates and creates as he so wishes. 
John 8, 46, he says, who can convict me of sin? In other words, I am sinless. All my life before, no sin. All my life in the future, there will be no sin. Right now, as I'm speaking to you, there's no way I could be lying. Because there's no sin. And if I look at that speaker and I call it black, I'm not lying. My words are so powerful, it will have to change to black. Because my words create. I am sinless. And not only am I sinless, but I, I will take on your sins of the past and your sins of the future and your sins in the present and not just those of you on the front row whose sins are many. <laughs> and not just you behind the pulpit who is the chief of sinners in this room. But every one of you that is a bold statement, and it would be ridiculous to think if this was just some historical Jewish nobody to believe in something like that. But if Jesus, in fact, raised from the dead, that is something quite different. Quite different. Then he says something crazy. He said, the Father and I are one. John 10, 30-33. Which is to say, not only am I from heaven, where God is from, but I am God. This puts Jesus in a, in a totally different category. He's not just one of many religious leader choices. Buddha never said, I'm God. Krishna never said, I'm God. Joseph Smith never said, I'm God. Confucius never said it. Muhammad never said it. Jesus is not just a choice among religious leaders. He is a whole new category. I am God. Which would mean something ridiculous were it just historical Jesus. Something quite different if the resurrection in fact happened. Someone that you can pray to. Someone that you can indeed trust the most intimate parts of your life to. Someone that you can give your life to. Mark 2, 5 through 7, he says something ridiculous. Not only will I bear your sins, but I will forgive your sins. John 14, 6, I am the way. And we learned last Sunday that he said before it happened, I will die and three days later I'll rise from the dead. This wasn't anything that anyone thought, oh, neat, that's interesting. No, they thought it was ridiculous. Peter even said, you don't have to go to Jerusalem and die. That, don't do that. Let's keep you around for a little while. We like you. We want to hire you on full time. But Jesus said, you don't understand my path. His statements were very difficult. Such as, take and eat me. In your life, you're searching because of the hunger of your soul. The reality of the resurrection points to a deeper reality in each one of us, and that is this life is not our only life. We have a physical life, but then there is a side of you that is eternal. And Jesus was saying on this day, hard to receive for those who have not received the message of the resurrection. Because if you haven't received the message of, of the resurrection, the idea of you having an eternal side sounds kind of ridiculous. Without a resurrection, we all just, you only have one life and everything's fine and tidy. And you just, you square up with that one shadowy day that we all have in common. But other than that, life is fine. But if there is a resurrection, then there is another side of you. And Jesus is saying, what I have is to feed that side of you. Not physically, but spiritually. Now, Jesus gathering a multitude to feed is what I think uh, precipitated this statement. He had fed, a, a, in some texts, 3,000, other texts, 5,000. And this crowd came to look for him one day, and he basically said here in this chapter, you're coming for me looking for that. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for the food that nourishes your physical body, 
What you're not getting is that I'm here to feed something different. Now, it was, it was pretty uh, miraculous for him to draw a crowd like that. Three or 5,000 people was not something common in Jesus' day. Moreover, feeding that many people was not something common in his day. You and I have pantries when we go home where we have days, some of us weeks, some of us months, if you're preparing for, you know, of food in your pantry. But back then, food came by a lot harder. Whether or not you had food depended a lot upon the weather because of their agricultural uh, culture. So feeding masses of people was uh, much more difficult than it is now, much less three to 5,000 people. That was a huge feat. You didn't even have that sort of gathering unless it was, say, maybe a wedding, but still not 5,000. So for Jesus to be feeding this many people was a big deal. He had gathered quite a crowd. I mean, who doesn't want to catch dinner and a show? And Jesus was providing dinner theater, a meal and some magic tricks. People wanted to come and see. And so he took this occasion for those who were looking on him to say, there's more. I'm trying to give you more. I'm trying to feed that which will live eternally. And this was hard to hear. Not only for the people, the text says, this statement of his separated him. Many people started going home. You think Jesus was always magnetic and drawing people to himself? Not all the time. And these words were hard to hear, and people left. But not just the people. It even said his disciples. His disciples started leaving him based on this word. Now, it's not said in this text and, and I grant that I'm taking artistic license, but here is my interpretation of why the disciples left. I think for the disciples, the crowd was an exciting thing. I think pre-Jesus, the disciples didn't have too much notoriety. But since Jesus was their champion, because of all the nights and encores of dinner theater... If he was their champion, then all of a sudden, Jesus' closest comrades were the crowd's champion. I think the disciples got something off being Jesus' friend in front of the crowd. I imagine, as Jesus started to say, okay, you like the food? I'll be here all week. The feels great. Glad you're enjoying it. Now I want to feed you with something different. I want you to eat my flesh. I bet the disciples were like, uh, Peter, that's not on his itinerary. Uh, Jesus, come here. We'll be back in five minutes if you folks would just wait. Just wait. Jesus, Jesus. They love it when you talk about you know, being happy, a sermon like that, or, or, or how to avoid worrying, or uh, you know, even prayer. They seem to get into that, but you know, what are you doing? This was not good for them because the crowd was leaving they had been following i think the ones that were leaving on this day were following jesus because following him was feeding their own sense of ego inflating their own sense of self which was to jesus not it was antithetical to feeding them spiritually because oh they were feeding their spirit by following jesus but not with jesus they were feeding themselves with things of the world. Their ego, their pl pride, their inflated sense of self. I've seen this in church. I've done it myself. If you have ever felt this way or if you've ever seen someone come to church for the purpose of being seen, that person has just followed Jesus to feed their own ego or inflated sense of self. It can, be, it can happen. If, you, if you've ever seen someone come to church for the sake of, say, making business connections, then you have just seen someone follow Jesus for the sake of their own sense of identity, ego, or maybe putting real world bread on their physical table rather than being fed spiritually. Jesus was saying something very hard. I want to feed something deeper in you. A hunger that you might not even know you have. A hunger that is controlling your life in a way that you probably don't even know. 
So what does that look like? This is one of the reasons why we follow certain commands of Jesus that sound so strange, like, do this in remembrance of me. On that night when he said, do this in remembrance of me, they weren't just sharing bread and wine. They also washed each other's feet. Now, if you notice, when we had the Seder, all of a sudden, 250 people turned into a crowd of maybe 90. See what I'm saying? It's a hard saying. Now, that teaching of Jesus, wash someone else's feet, makes very little sense. But when you follow Jesus, and you learn what he's trying to teach you and your spirit, it begins to make sense. I, I washed Paul's feet. Do you think for a minute that I wanted, I mean, he's got fine feet. I'm not saying anything about his feet. But do you think for a minute that I wanted to caress, and I don't say that word a lot, the back of his heel with my hand? I didn't. Not only did I not want to do it, I didn't want to be seen doing it. There was nothing in that moment about feeding my ego or my inflated sense of self. Quite the opposite. What I was receiving in this command of Jesus that makes very little sense, I was feeding on humility, which is Jesus. I was literally feeding on Jesus. And do you think taking the seat and letting someone else wash my feet was any easier? It wasn't. Just as humiliating. I have narrow, bony feet. I don't want anyone looking at my feet. And then I was wearing black socks all day, which meant there were black threads in my toenails. <laughs> it looked like I hadn't washed my feet for a week. There was nothing self-inflating about that moment. I was feeding on the life of Jesus. Literally, my spirit was being fed. And so he says to those who are leaving, looks square in the eye of his closest disciples and says, now, are you going to leave too? This saying is hard to those walking away. Is that what's going to happen to you when my sayings get difficult? And Peter says something beautiful. Where am I supposed to go? You have the words of life. Peter had been convinced after following Jesus for this time, there was nothing that touched his inner self more than the teachings of Jesus. And so he trusted. My beautiful youth, in high school right now, you are insulated with a great youth group. And it keeps you at the feet of Jesus, but you will go to college, and this, the youth group is going to be harder to find. You will find opportunities to feed your spirit with things of this world. And you'll hear that voice. Are you going to leave me too? And you get out of college and you go into your business. You made it all the way through school following Jesus, but in your business, to run with the pack, you've got to do certain things on a business trip with the other boys, visiting certain establishments. And you may hear that voice. Are you going to leave me too? Or maybe you don't go on business trips with the boys, but you go by yourself. And you find anonymity. Nobody's watching. What are you going to look at all night in that hotel room? Are you going to leave me too? Or maybe it's not your career. You're fine. You've held on to Jesus, but you get into a marriage and everyone around you seems to be happier because their marriage before was disposable. And they've upgraded on a newer model with fewer miles and a bunch of different upgrades, you know? <laughs> Sliding electric windows and leather seats that vibrate and warm up in the cold, you know, like that. Oh, yeah. And you hear that voice as you're tempted. As you're tempted to ignore the covenant you made in front of everyone and before God, for better or for worse, you're tempted to ignore that, you're going to hear that voice. Are you going to leave me too? 
just because my sayings are hard? Maybe I haven't been feeding your spirit like I wanted to. If you, like Peter, begin to know the nourishment that comes to your soul based on the words of Christ, you will increase your chances to not turn and walk away with the crowd. Develop your prayer life. Feed on Jesus. Develop a time in your life where you read Scripture. Feed on Jesus. You are feeding your spirit. Bring your presence to the body of believers more than just once a week. Do it twice a week. Get involved in a small group. You feed your physical self all week, not just one day a week. And not only do you feed your physical self all week, you feed your physical self three times a day. Some more than that. Feed yourself all week, not just once a week. Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice, a gift. Offer your gifts. Jesus offered his hands in service to God. Find a way to serve. This is feeding on Jesus. This is remembering. 